She becomes the first woman in history, black or white, to become involved in the planning and execution of a raid into enemy territory. Mm -hmm. And that part of the Harriet Tubman story has not been told widely. Welcome to Coastal with Catherine. This episode we feature both Harriet Tubman and the town of Mitchellville, which is located on Hilton Head Island. What do they have in common? They both changed American history. Once again, we're going to join Rich and Todd of the Hilton Head History Tours, and our first stop is Mitchellville. And you know, Rich and I are at Mitchellville. We just arrived, and I want to have Rich tell us a little bit about Mitchellville and how did Mitchellville come about? We'll be happy to, and uh, so the story of Mitchellville really begins with the liberation of all of the slaves in this area with the Union invasion. Following that, uh, the night of the invasion itself, uh, slaves who had escaped from the plantations bordering the Port Royal Sound started to arrive on Hilton Head looking for protection from their former oppressors and or from the Confederate patrols that were going around the areas where they had escaped. And uh, over the months that follow, hundreds and thousands will arrive here on the island. And there are some estimates that say by February or March of 1862, there were as many as 8,500 former slaves that had come to Hilton Head for protection. Well, the Union didn't have the supplies to deal with that. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have tents for housing. They didn't have any of that. And so measures had to be taken fairly quickly because a humanitarian crisis develops. And they finally had prefabricated barracks buildings sent down from the north that were then assembled on the grounds near the fort. And they would put into those three to four hundred foot long barracks buildings, they would put a hundred families, former slave families. Their sanitary facilities were just slit trench latrines out back and so the living conditions weren't ideal by a long shot and they were pretty miserable. And it started causing a lot of tension between the former slaves and the soldiers whom they lived very near to. Well, it got worse over time. A couple of commanders of the Department of the South were replaced. And finally, in September of 1862, a man named Ormsby McKnight Mitchell comes to Hilton Head as the third commanding general of the Department of the South, the Union Department of the South. Up until that time, there had been a lot of trouble with the uh, slaves in the areas of the fort and in the encampments around the Port Royal Sound. So something had to be done. What Mitchell discovered when he arrived was that although they were being housed in these barracks, they were also being charged $12 a month for rent, which just so happened to equate to what their pay was by the, Union, by the federal government working for the army here at Port Royal. So Mitchell said that has to come to a stop. They're basically working for free. So he ends that practice. That's okay. okay. And then goes around the Port Royal Sound area to all the Union camps, talking to the commanders and the soldiers in those camps, trying to get a feel for the pulse of what's going on. And after one week, he comes back. He comes back to the command post that was directly across Fish Hall Creek Marsh from where we stand right now. And when he gets back, he'll go up into the watchtower the watchtower and the signal station that stood on top of the tallest building in the area at the time. And as he's looking out, he looks north over the creek and the marsh to this wide open cotton field that we're standing on now, which was the cotton field of the Drayton Plantation. Okay. And he said, what better place to locate a community for these people, these contrabands, than on the land of the former Confederate commander? because the owner of this plantation was also the Confederate general in charge of all of the troops between Charleston and the Savannah River. And so he sets aside 900 acres of that Drayton plantation land as the site for the future village of what are going to become freedmen. And in the first week that he's back, he, he works feverishly. He, he actually lays out a plat for the town, perpendicular parallel street grid system. He'll recommend a structure for the town government town council, mayor, marshal, etc. 
He'll even lay out rules and regulations that he thinks need to be in place so that there's order and discipline kept in the town. Right. And he'll go so far as to recommend a law for the compulsory education of children aged 6 to 15. And he'll do all of that. Now he has to per per persuade people that it's a, it's a good idea to have a town for him. He starts with his general staff. They come on board fairly quickly. But now he has to get the Freedman community to, in fact, embrace his concept. And that's a big step for them, because up until that time, they have been cared for every day of their life. The thought that they might live independently, away from the protection of the fort, even though it's only a few hundred yards, and on their own to self-govern and self-discipline and do all of these other things, that's a big stretch. But he works with the leaders of the black community, and finally, they come on board with his concept. So he'll write a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury telling him of his plans and telling him that he needs money to build a town for these former slaves. And without waiting for word from Washington, he'll actually give the order to the nine sawmills that are here on Hilton Head to start cutting the lumber for the building of the houses in the town that will later be named Mitchellville in his honor. He'll do all of that and then he'll become feverish and he be, he's taken over to an officer's hospital in Beaufort and he'll die of yellow fever 45 days after he arrived on Hilton Head. Oh, wow. But the way he had planned, the way he had communicated, the power of his vision, and the way he had en enrolled the community of freedmen ended up having Mitchellville implemented almost without variation. And what was the town of Mitchellville goes on through the war to become a thriving community. By the end of 1865, when the troops are mustered out of service, there are over 3,500, some people feel closer to 5,000 people living in the town of Mitchellville in over 500 homes. And those people will stay in place up through the end of 1868 when the last of the Union troops leave the island. You know, that is great history. Thank you very much. You're very I mean, welcome. You know, we all have heard the stories, but there's, enjoy the passion in their storytelling. That is really lovely. And Thank I just, you. and again, we have this community because of General Ormsby McKnight Mitchell. It's a, it's a mouthful. That is say. a mouthful. So I have one more story I want you to share with sure. us quickly because we, we want to go over and look at the, um, the observation deck. Uh, Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, yeah. You know, there yeah. was just been a movie about her. Yes. And I've seen the movie and I thought it was a, a great movie, but I don't know the history all that well. But I, for someone who didn't know, I thought it was a good way for me to learn about her. Well, it was, it's, it's a wonderful movie and they did a nice job with the great bulk of her story. Uh, but there's a piece of that story that really occurs while she's here in Port Royal, in the Hilton Head area and on the island of Hilton Head. When she arrives, she is given the duty of basically educating the former slave women how to do laundry and how to mend clothing so that they become seamstresses and laundresses for the Union troops and earn money that way. And she'll do that for a short period of time until the commanding general and the, and the Navy commander of the... Uh, of the squadron that's here in Port Royal Sound learn that she's present. Well, Harriet Tubman was a nationally known figure at the time for the work she'd done in the Underground Railroad. So they bring her in to interview her and instantly they realize we need to use her with regard to our intelligence operations. So they basically put her in charge of interviewing all of the recently arrived families of, of former slaves into the Port Royal area and she can gather information about Confederate troop strength and where they're located and that type of thing that she can then relay to the intelligence staff here at the fort. And they'll use that information to plan their campaigns and that type of thing. She's also put in charge of a small group of what are called commandos or spies that are people who actually go behind the Confederate lines and get information about the Confederacy. A lot of her story is disputed, but we have actual evidence that she was paid $200 by the adjutant for General David Hunter, one of the commanders of the Department of the South, for what is quoted on the receipt as Secret Service work. So she was definitely engaged mm -hmm. in that. But, her, but the main accomplishment, I think, that's so astounding is that she'll go on through that intelligence involvement to be involved in the planning and the execution of a raid up a river to, to liberate a lot of slaves from major Confederate plantations, major cotton producing plantations owned by the main secessionists in this area. And it's called the Cumbie River Raid. And she becomes the first woman in history, black or white, to become involved in the planning and execution of a raid into enemy territory.
Mm. And that part of the Harriet Tubman story has not been told widely. Some historians dispute it, but there are records from reporters that were on the docks in Beaufort when the fleet arrived with 800 former slaves on board the decks of these three small ships, and they could hardly, you know, survive on the decks. They almost had to go overboard. And these reporters will quote the fact that the Union commander of the raid, when he was talking about the operation, gives her credit for being in the wheelhouse and planning the raid with them. So, you know, you can go on with the scholarly disputes yeah. all the time, but Harriet Tubman was here. She had a marvelous contribution to this area, and she was gone about nine months after she arrived, back to continue doing work, mostly up in Canada with the yeah. uh, people up there. The railroad, that's amazing. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't you love that story? I mean, again, it's the, lots of the history that we have. So let's move forward, let's go find Todd. And Todd, so now we're walking out to this observation deck, and what's interesting here, we're going to look over this, it's, well, the marsh, and right now it's low tide, so there's no water here, but this was actually a battleground at one time, correct? This was supposed to be the first amphibious landing that took place in the United States, but it failed because of a storm that actually disbands the largest naval fleet at the time, and this is in early November of 1861 at the eve of the Civil War, the Union Army has taken over Fort Sumter, and now they need to get further into the south. A big storm comes up and, and disperses this giant flotilla, and what ends up happening is, even though no men are lost, all of the cavalry and all of the boats that would have been used for the amphibious landing are lost. Many ships are demasted, and they actually end up towing a lot of the ships all the way from Annapolis down to the area that we're at. So the Battle of Port Royal itself, which took place Right there, that's the open mouth of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, there was two forts at the time. There was Fort, Bo Fort Beauregard, which is right across the way there, and Fort Walker, which was right here on this point. Where that large house is, is where the small fort of Fort Walker sat, directly on the other side. Um, unfortunately for the Confederates, they were very handy with their cannon, and they were very uh, adept. There's uh, documents from the Union Army stating as such, but their quartermaster on Fort Beauregard wasn't so great, and he didn't send the right munitions. So as the battle opens, the Confederates fire their first volley, and then they leave Fort Beauregard because when they go to reload their munitions, their cannons, they realize they got the wrong ones. Oh no. So what point is it to stay and defend a fort when you don't have any way of, of fighting? So they left, but the people over here at Fort Walker stayed, and, and actually this is the first case where you have two brothers, one in the Confederate Army, one in the Union, fighting each other during the Civil War. Um, and the battle itself took place right out there. Uh, 72 ships, I believe, were, were involved in it. Uh, the Confederates had uh, a small contingency of ships that they brought around from Savannah over uh, through the uh, skinny part of the island at Skull Creek there. And they came out very bravely, fired one or two shots into the Union uh, Navy and then turned and ran. Well, this causes confusion amongst the Union uh, commanders, and they actually break off their attack, and it becomes chaos out, out at sea, uh, and, and many lives are lost on both sides, uh, mostly accidents on the Union side. Um, the battle takes place. It only lasts about four hours, even though the buildup took about five days, and, and as Rich was talking about earlier, the great skedaddle takes place as the, Confeder as the Union uh, ships are coming in. If you could imagine being a, a young soldier in Fort Walker, um, and looking out one morning and here shows up five big ships and you start to think to yourself, oh, something's going on. And then the next morning there's 15 more and the next morning there's 10 more until finally there's 70 some odd ships out there. I'm just thinking of the vision. I mean, I can see the water right here. Just to have 70, I mean, that's... Right there. And they had no telecommunications. Oh, certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the history. This is the one thing I wanted to do so much for the, my show, Coastal with Catherine, is that we're going to be visiting all these coastlines and they all have history to be told. And Todd, that's a great story. What else can you share with us at this point? Well, the, as the battle... Uh, is, is finishing and the Union Army comes ashore. The Confederates, they themselves, they, over the cover of darkness, they, they actually make their way off and go past out Skull Creek into Bluffton and where they remain. There is no more battles that take place on Hilton Head for the remainder of the war, but this is basically a, a waypoint. Um, Fort Walker itself uh, ends up having a dock that goes about 1,500 feet out into the sound. They put railroad tracks on it, and then they would uh, unload and load their, their goods as, as they needed, supplies, and then 
they would build, they had built warehouses very much so with the freedmen's labor uh, that were here. And, and remember these, we say freedmen, but at this point in time, this is prior to the Emancipation Proclamation by about 14 months. So these first souls that are coming here, hearing That's that right. the Union Army is here, uh, they're not truly free. So they were very courageous in, in their efforts to get here with the possibility that, the, that they didn't know if the Confederates were going to come back and win and they would have been in a very bad position. They start to work and they actually earn up to three dollars a day, uh, which is unheard of because they had been slaves their whole life. And they start to build the warehouses and help to build the warehouses and the railroads uh, that actually house all the munitions and all the supplies for the Union Army. Um, there was actually a beautiful hotel out there. Uh, Jefferson Davis uh, actually spent a night in the jail that was there at the end of the war. Uh, there was a big storm and they had to, to, to stop over there. Um, the history, uh, the, the four years of history, yeah. we certainly don't have time to go I into, know. and that's why we do our tours. So I know, this is what I want to tell you. Come to Hilton Head and go to the tours. Talk to Rich and Todd because there's just so much more to talk about. So what do you think? There is so much wonderful history today, and I just love every bit of it. I want to encourage you, call Todd and Rich to come see their tours. It's called Hilton Head History, history tours. tours, and they have a great bus. They'll take you around. There's all three hours or whatever you want to do. And we want to thank you. So we'll see you next time. I want to thank you so much for joining me at Coastal with Catherine. I hope you enjoyed the show. I enjoyed it so much because of the history lesson that we received. Now do me a favor. If you'd like to hear more of these stories or see them on my YouTube channel, I need your help. Please like and subscribe to our channel so we will bring you more stories. And also, I want to hear where you'd like me to go. There is lots of coastlines in our country. And if you have a favorite place, do share that with me as well. So I want to thank you for joining me. And I'll see you next time at Coastal with Catherine.